this case I'm entitling coffee beans, salt, and pepper. So this is a mid-40s uh, uh, female with a recent diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia on an endometrial biopsy. That's why they did the hysterectomy. Uh, at the time of histologic examination, the endometrium was totally normal, but there was an incidental finding that was not noted at the time of growth description uh, in the ovary. Uh, and so what is your diagnosis on this thing? So this is the first slide I looked at. Um, I looked at it because there was a, a mark on the slide out of about the 40 slides that were submitted. And I noted this adenofibromatous pattern. The first thing I thought about was, well, this is probably an incidental tumor, should be a Brenner tumor. Uh, so it's got a fibroma look, solid epithelial nests. Uh, however, when you look at the cytology in that inset, it's not the typical cytology that we see with a Brenner tumor. Uh, the nuclei are more rounded. Usually Brenner tumors have a more oval or spindled appearance to, to the nuclei. And there's a, a fairly evenly dispersed uh, chromatin pattern. Um, and then when you back off and look at it, this is kind of a, a, a nodule that, that goes up to the surface. Here's another nodule. Uh, I've never seen a Brenner tumor uh, present with multiple nodules. So here's another nodule on the same ovary with the same histologic appearance, a small uh, nest of a neo bland neoplastic epithelium. Higher power uh, shows the rounded nuclei, uh, the uniform uh, chromatin distribution, so-called salt and pepper. And then there's an, a third nodule that is really right up on the surface of the ovary, um, uh, showing similar histologic fears. In addition, uh, there was a nodule in the fallopian tube, uh, and the inset again shows a cytology along with some mitotic activity. Uh, I did two stains, a chromogranin and synaptophysis, and as you can see, these stains are, are strongly positive. So the trainee responses uh, pretty much got this, a metastatic carcinoid tumor, a Brenner tumor, a metastatic carcinoma, most of the time people are going to want to know where that's coming from. So Brenner tumors uh, can uh, be very small and large. Uh, and so the small ones may be an incidental finding, as in this uh, case. And here you can see the epithelial nests. Uh, sometimes they're widely dispersed, uh, varying in size. It's not uncommon to see uh, central uh, glandular differentiation, often uh, mucinous. Uh, you can see the nuclei tend to be a little bit spindled, and some of them have uh, longitudinal grooves. Here we've got a Brenner tumor and a carcinoid tumor uh, compared side by side. Uh, you can see that not all of the nuclei have longitudinal grooves, only a few. And it, if you look at the coffee beans down at the bottom, not all those coffee beans have longitudinal grooves. It just depends on how they sit on the table. Um, the carcinoid tumor that we had in this case, you could actually see the uh, neural secretory granules uh, in the cytoplasm of many of, many of the cells. So metastatic carcinoid tumor uh, to the ovary is not th that uncommon. Uh, in this uh, small series, they had 17 cases of uh, metastatic carcinoid tumors, most of them presented with bilateral disease. And that's true for most metastatic tumors of the ovary, about 80% or so present with bilateral disease. But that means that you've got 15 to 20% that may only have unilateral disease, as in this case. Most of the time, the distal ileum is the primary site in this series. 100% of the time, it was the primary site. Interestingly, this series also uh, had METs to other, commonly had METs to other uh, sites, including the liver, peritoneum, breast, and bone, and that's in order of frequency. And despite having diffuse disease in this series, uh, the five-year survival was 90%. What about the uh, use of other stains to uh, predict where the carcinoid tumor is? Well, see, some, some authors have suggested CDX2. Uh, nothing in life is perfect, and CDX2 is not perfect. Uh, GI tumors tend to be a CDX2 positive, but a significant number of uh, primary carcinoid tumors of the ovary are positive. 
this uh, is a case report uh, where they used PCR. Uh, this was in a uh, to, to determine whether this was a primary uh, carcinoid tumor of the ovary or a metastatic uh, process. This was a older lady uh, which had a who had a large ovarian tumor, uh, and there was some lymphascular space involvement. But they were able to show that this was a primary carcinoid tumor, hence would have a much better better prognosis than a metastatic carcinoid tumor. Metastatic tumors of the ovary are not uncommon in the uh, surgical pathology arena. Uh, about as high as 10% of cases uh, may uh, be metastatic in your uh, gross pathology area. So it's something to think about uh, when you're dealing with unusual ovarian tumors. Um, Excluding the GYN uh, sites, uh, so most metastatic processes to the ovary come from other GYN sites. The most common metastatic sites are the intestines, particularly the large colon, uh, stomach, breast, and uh, hematopoietic. So clues to metastatic uh, processes. In our case, bi uh, we did not have bilateral disease. Uh, the disease, an unusual disease distribution. So most ov ovarian epithelial tumors involve the abdominal cavity, the surfaces of organs. So if you've got an ovarian mass with a parenchymal metastasis to the liver, think metastatic process. If you've got an ovarian mass in only disease above the diaphragm, think of a metastatic process. Unusual histologic features. If it doesn't fit the typical ovarian tumor, I think uh, metastatic process. And in our case, uh, that was that was the case. Multinodular growth. Uh, so we had multiple nodules in one ovary, tended to be toward the surface of the ovary. Good indication you're dealing with a metastatic process. Extensive lymphascular space invasion, not present in our case. Extensive necrosis, not present in our case. What was present in our case was a surface involvement. Uh, thank you uh, for responding to this case.